good evening to uh, to each and every one of y'all. And I guess if anybody's out there on our time, uh, U.S. time, good good afternoon to you, or almost afternoon. We uh, I want to ask you if you would to please rejoice with us in uh, in Lafayette as we added a brother in Christ this morning. It's fantastic that one of our um, young men, Andrew Blackwood, um, wanted to uh, wanted to follow Jesus, wanted to put him on in baptism, and so it made it where it was a little bit of a rush me getting uh, getting back to you, but it was definitely worth it in that we got to um, rejoice with with him and, and his family as he um, took the just the ultimate step in um, in faith and starting a relationship with with the Lord, and so that's fantastic news. Please uh, rejoice with us as we rejoice with him and um and his family um it feels like forever since i have been with y'all and i've missed it greatly i know that um every time that i'm with you i i enjoy it and i think i'm probably more encouraged by y'all than than y'all are by me um but i i look forward to and long to hopefully one day being able to um, be with you and and um meet you in person that would be be fantastic um for for us um the the direction for this morning as you saw the scripture reading so if you have a bible philippians chapter 4 will be the place we need to be at um the direction for this morning i want us to uh or sorry for y'all this evening that i want us to look at is is peace um and maybe having a more biblical understanding and a better understanding of what does scripture mean when it talks about peace. Um, as it was already read for us, before we dive in and look specifically at this text, because I believe that Philippians chapter 4 answers the question of what peace is and what peace is supposed to be and the way we're supposed to see peace and the way that we live a, li a peaceful life, um, not only for us, but that's the sermon title suggested, Contagious Peace, the kind of peace that spreads to other people as we interact with them. Um, Philippians 4 is kind of the answer to that kind of peace. But before we get to that, I want to pose, I want to pose the question of why do we need to talk about this peace? Um, and, and why does our world uh, lack in, in peace? Because it seems the more people that I talk to and the more people that I interact with, the more people I find are overwhelmed by just anxiety and by worries. Um, they have personal struggles. They have busy schedules. They feel like they're always behind and can never catch up with everything they're supposed to fulfill and everything they're supposed to do. And so in this world that's lacking in peace, how exactly does that harm our view of peace when we come to scripture? Well, there's a couple of different things I think that our world teaches when it comes to peace that we've got to realize um, is a false sense of peace and not biblical peace before we just start talking about it as if we're all on the same page. So almost like before we can get to building this, um, this new, new structure or building this new tower or building this new house of biblical peace, maybe what we need to do first is take some time to tear down some of the um, false understandings and misunderstandings when it comes to peace that each of us sometimes buy into. A couple different things that our world does that gives us a misunderstanding of peace. The first one is that the world, I believe, teaches us and leads us to a, a peace that is only seen um, in spurts and it's only seen temporarily. So to illustrate this, I, I was preaching this sermon just last week on Mother's Day. And one of the questions that I asked for um, some of our mothers that were in the audience, I asked, would you take a gift of peace? If peace could be somehow wrapped up and boxed up and just given to you? Would you take that over the flowers that might be bought, and bought or the chocolates that might be bought or, um, you know, the, the meals that may be made or purchased for you? Would you trade all of that in to have somebody gift you peace? And I think that whenever we ask that question, sometimes 
um, that where their minds went and where our minds go is, well, that's easy because in order to give my, my spouse peace or give my wife peace as a Mother's Day gift, I'll just get the kids out of the house for a little while. All of the chaos and them running around and them playing and them being kids and them arguing and, and them them coloring on the walls or doing whatever. I'll just I'll remove I'll remove the chaos for two hours, three hours, a half a day, an entire evening, and that'll give her peace. But but notice what we do. I believe that we try to confine peace to something that can only be attained for a, a period of time or a stretch of time. We say, I know, I know what we'll do. I know how I'll find peace. I've got this vacation booked where I'm going to take off of work. I'm going to take a few days and, and, and not work. And we're instead going to go to this place that we've been wanting to. Maybe we're going to stay somewhere away from home or, or visit some landmark that we've never seen before or find, you know, some, some oasis or some beach or somewhere to just sit and relax and do nothing. And for that few days or for that week or however long it is, then we'll have peace in that moment. We'll have peace. But notice we've done the exact same thing. Wrongly, we have almost, we, we, well, here's not almost, we've written off, we've written off the possibility of living, dwelling, and existing in a peaceful state with our God. And we've bought the lie that peace can only be experienced in these bite-sized moments. And so we think that, well, I live my entire work week for just a few hours of peace on my day off. I work my entire year for maybe just a few days or, or a week of vacation where I can get away and not have to work and not have to stress and not have to worry. And we believe we've reduced peace down into something that can only be experienced in short stints. When scripture, Philippians chapter four in specific, speaks of a peace that transcends that, speaks of a peace that we live with, walk with, and in the Lord can dwell in and feel every single moment of every single day. How do we get that peace? Second thing that we do wrong whenever we think about peace and teach peace. where The second thing we got to tear down that our world tries to build up about peace is this. It believes that the definition of peace is the absence of chaos and conflict. Um, there's a story, maybe you've heard it before. It's a pretty popular sermon illustration. So I didn't write it and it didn't come with me, but it illustrates the point really well. Um, there was a, a very wealthy man that put out a, um, a I guess you'd call it a, a challenge or a commission um, for a piece of art to be made. And he was going to take in all of these different pieces of art that had, had been made and um, decide, judge them for himself and decide which one of them best encapsulated the assignment was to encapsulate peace in one picture. In one drawing, in one portrait, in one painting, I want you to, to embody peace. And whoever did the best job of that, he was going to uh, pay just a hefty sum for their art to hang in his home. And so as all of these different artists came from all around the world, they painted the most beautiful pictures that you had ever seen. You think of things that, that are peaceful. You had um, scenes of the sun setting over a, a beautifully cut field that had been farmed. Or maybe it was a, a serene image of a white sanded beach with just the perfect size waves where you can almost just hear the rhythmic pounding of waves crashing on the shore. Some, some images were of beautiful um, scapes of, of flowers or beautiful mountain peaks that just take your breath away. All of these different images of peace, he walked by, by each one, one after the other, and appreciated every single um, one of them, but those aren't any of the ones that he selected. Would you like to know the one that he selected? It was a picture, a picture drawn of a um, rocky, stormy sea bank 
no sand to be found, um, no real peacefulness or, or beauty to be found in it on first glance. As you see, just this rocky shore, there was a light tower there, um, storm coming down, dark clouds, rain, waves crashing, and not in that peaceful rhythmic way, in the way that would make you nervous to be anywhere near it. Um, but in the corner, perched on the lighthouse, was a tiny, beautiful cardinal, little red bird, singing its heart out, singing the most beautiful song in the midst of the storm. And that's the picture that he chose. And the reason is that what Scripture teaches us about peace that our world doesn't understand is our world believes, first and foremost, what did we say? That peace is something that can only be experienced in bite-sized little bits and, and it can only be tasted briefly. But the second thing is the belief that peace is simply the absence of chaos and that peace is governed and dictated by our circumstances, meaning that our peace is out of our control. But what does that beautiful picture of that little red bird in the middle of the storm teach us? It teaches us that true peace, biblical peace, not bite-sized peace, but a peace that we can live in, in our Lord, is a peace that is not dictated by our circumstances, but is dictated by our connection with and the presence of the Lord within us and, and with us. And it changes your, your mindset and, and church, it'll change your life. If we stop assuming that the only way we're going to get peace is if we can get all the right circumstances lined out, because I'm sorry to burst your bubble or pop your balloon. Um, we'll never get all the right circumstances lined out. We'll never have everything perfectly aligned and problem free and conflict free and anxiety free. Like that's the entire half of the message of Matthew chapter six is he's telling them not to be anxious. He's saying, I'm not telling you not to be anxious because your life's going to be great. He said, I'm telling you not to be anxious because who you have in the Lord is worth trusting in and worth handing all that over to. So peace is no longer something that we experience in little chunks. And it's no longer something that is dictated by the circumstances and the life around us. Because whenever we do that, we almost just forfeit and give up and say, well, my life's too hard. My life's not perfect. I've got family problems. I've got work problems. I've got financial problems. We know what all those feel like. And we think if those are never worked out, then I'll never truly experience peace. But that's not what God's offering. God's offering a peace that we can experience, not in the absence of those things, but despite those things. Now that we've torn that down, let's start doing some building in Philippians chapter four. He's going to share with us how to have that peace um, and how to have that peace, not just for a moment, not just for a week vacation, but every second of every day. And I'll tell you this, it will be so different. And you and I, once we have this peace, embody this peace and live it out, will be so different than everybody else around us. They won't help um, but ask, how are you so peaceful in the midst of chaos? And that's where the contagious aspect of this comes in, where we can share the Lord and share that peace with other people. So what does the text say? How do we get to this peace? We love, we love Romans, I'm sorry, Philippians 4 six and seven, don't be anxious about everything, but in prayer and supplication um, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Beautiful verse, bumper sticker verse, right? Everybody knows it. People memorize it. They put it on t-shirts. They, they engrave it on the Bibles. Like they love this. And rightfully so beautiful verse, but let's put this verse in its context and in its passage and see how the entire passage works towards a lifelong peace in the Lord. Okay, so let's back up to verse two. You may think that this, this is a verse about conflict, and I believe it starts there, but it gets us to the beginning of peace. So Philippians chapter four, starting in verse two, I entreat um, Yodia and I entreat Sintiq to agree in the Lord. 
Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers who name, whose names are in the books of book of life. You say, preacher, how does that have anything to do with peace? It seems to me from me reading it that these two women are in conflict. Isn't that the opposite of peace? Well, I agree. It starts in, in some kind of dispute and some kind of conflict that these two women have in the other as have, have with each other as it urges them in the end of verse two to agree in the Lord. But notice, notice, what it instructs them to do and what Paul instructs them to do in verse three. Okay, perfect. I, I'm so sorry. Hopefully that doesn't happen again. I know that messes with the recording and everything else. Um, technology, you can't can't live with it, can't live without it sometimes. Um, so where we were at in verses two and three, the first, I think, step for us to, to getting into a, a life of peace is being at work in the Lord is what verses two and three talk about. And I love, I love this. Um, it, they are so at work in the Lord. It calls for their need of companionship and help, okay? So even though they're in conflict with each other, they're both at work in the Lord. And there's two things that I want to pull out of that that sometimes rob us of our peace. The first thing is when we're not at work in the Lord, it's much easier for us to become critical spectators of those who are at work in the Lord. It, it really is. Um, it, we become critical whenever we're the ones sitting on the sidelines and not the ones in the middle of the game. I know um, that where y'all are in the world, it's probably a much bigger soccer place than it is baseball and basketball and football, uh, which I guess y'all are football, but the, the other kind of football, not the American football. Um, but can you imagine how much easier it is to be critical of who's on the field when when you're not running, you're not sweating, you're not out of breath, you're not exerting, you're sitting on the sideline watching. And it's almost like we're with our clipboard deciding what they're doing right and what they're doing wrong. We're no different in the church sometimes. When we're not in the middle of fighting the good fight and we're not in the middle of laboring in the vineyard of the Lord, it's so much easier for us to sit back and be critical of what everybody else is doing. And sometimes we don't even realize that we're doing it. So it robs us of peace and it makes us more critical people whenever we are not hard at work for God. But when we are hard at work for God, I know you have. Have you ever gotten done with a good hard day's work and been able to just sit for a moment and feel sweet rest? I believe that's the beauty of the peace that God's offering us when we're hard at work with him. Um, and then the second thing that I want you to notice in this and bringing about peace, they, they labor so much that he calls for them to help these women. I believe not just help them through this disagreement, but help them in their labor. Whenever we're working so hard in the Lord that we need help, it does a couple things. One, it shows that our heart for the Lord is so big that we bite off more that we can chew and we need help. How beautiful of a thought is that? We want to do so much for our God that we take on more than we can physically accomplish by ourselves. And so we have to reach out to other people and pull them in and ask them to help labor with us in the Lord. And the second thing that it does, when you and I realize that, um, one, it takes on humility in us to go and ask for help and tell somebody else, I need you. And two, imagine how great it makes them feel. For us to ask them to help us in the Lord. It makes people feel needed, church. And we're in a world full of people that are craving to feel needed. And the product of being hard at work in that is what, let's pick up in verse 4, it's rejoicing and it's peace. So picking up in verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I'll say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. And here's those famous verses we read. We're going to read them again. 
do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind in Jesus. So notice, notice this, this path. The beginning talks about um, Yodia and, and Cintiq, and you have this illustration of peace between two people. But now we transition into through this prayer and through this rejoicing that we have in the Lord, we now have a peace between us and God. Starts with peace between others. Now we get to a peace between us and God. And how does that take place and where does that begin? I believe it begins with rejoicing in the Lord. How does rejoicing in the Lord bring about peace? One thing that we're horrible about doing, that I'm horrible about doing, that maybe you are too, is we get so caught up in our fast-paced world and fast-paced lives that we don't take time to reflect on what God's doing. That's why I love your prayer of thanksgiving that you have in, in your worship, at least in your Sunday evening worship, if not all your worship services. Because when we take time to think about what we should be thankful for, we take time to reflect and see and recognize what God is doing. And in the midst of all that anxiety and all that worry and all that struggle and all that trouble, what if we pause to think of all the ways God has already worked in our lives and that give us peace as we trust that he will continue to work for us and continue to work in our lives as he has so much in the past. And we open up to him this layer and this level of trust whenever we pray to him and whenever we ask him for help and aid and peace. And what I love about verse 7, it, it talks about two different things. The first thing that it says when it talks about the peace of God that surpasses all understanding, it says that it brings in a peace that we didn't have. So it corrects the problem, but it doesn't just correct the problem. What does verse 7 also say that it does? And it will guard your hearts. The peace that God has to offer, that is a lifelong peace, not dictated by rest or absence of conflict and not dictated by our circumstances, is a peace that comes in and it doesn't just fix the anxiety, it guards from future anxieties. It guards from future worries it's a protective layer around us it begins when we go into work for the lord it, it continues to prevail when we recognize our need for god to bring in that peace that we can't secure for ourselves so we reach out and we pray to him okay and then here's the last thing here's the last thing we normally stop at verse seven and it would be such a disservice to peace. Here's what we need to do to get to a place of peace, verses eight and nine. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, um, whatever is honorable, uh, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, just, pure, lovely, commendable. If there's any excellence, anything worthy of praise, think about these things, what you have learned, received, heard, and seen in me, practice these things. And here it is. And the God of peace will be with you. Do you see how we just went to a whole other level, whole other step? Sometimes we fail church. We fail in thinking that what we've got to do is you and I, we got to pray for peace. God's up in heaven. God hears our need for peace. And he's got, he's got this little, this little bowl of his seasoning dust. I don't know. I don't know if you like to, to cook food or season food. I have some, some meat smoking right now. You know what I did last night before I put it on, I covered it in a rub and in seasoning. I like my meat to be seasoned. Maybe you do too. And we sometimes fail in thinking I'm going to pray for peace. And then God's up there watching and he's got his little bowl of peace. And if he hears my prayer and he answers my prayer, maybe just maybe he'll sprinkle some down on my life. And, and sprinkle some peace. He's far off in heaven. I'm far off down here at earth. And all I need is God to sprinkle a little bit of peace dust in my life. But that's not what Philippians 4 talks about, church. It doesn't talk about a distant God that's sprinkling peace. It's talking about a close God that comes into our hearts and into our lives and into our beings that by his very presence in us, radiates peace quick story and i'll be done um i've got a dog i tell you about him quite a bit if you remember um he's a little australian shepherd his name is everett ulysses um here just about 15 minutes ago he was laying underneath my feet and i would have shown him to you but he's gone to 
run off and lay somewhere else, I'm sure. And so I'm not going to go find him to show him to you. Um, but little buddy um, has different reactions whenever Sarah and I are out of the house. Okay. Whenever we're out of the house, just a few weeks ago, um, Sarah, she teaches fourth grade, teaches fourth grade reading. Her and some of her teachers took this little end of year um, trip together. And so she was, she was away from the house for an evening. And so that means it was just me and me and Everett. Um, whenever Sarah's gone, she is his favorite. So some of you may say he's, he's a mama's boy. You know what I mean? He loves her more than he loves me. I don't know if any of y'all have pets, but you might know what that's like. Like whenever she comes into the door, it doesn't matter where he is. You're going to hear the little foot, footsteps of, of little Paul's running to greet her. So if it's me coming in the house, sometimes he doesn't even get up. He could care less, right? He doesn't love me the way he loves her. And to be fair, that doesn't bother me because at the end of the day, I want him to protect her more than he protects me, right? Like, I think that's part of his purpose as a dog. I want him to love her more and protect her more. Um, that's his reaction when she's not at home. You know what's crazy? He doesn't react like that when I'm not at home because because he and I don't have that same relationship of, of close love like that but you know what he does whenever i'm not at home he gets anxious sarah sarah dreads me not being at home not because it bothers her or not because she's scared but because she knows she's not going to be able to sleep a wink because when i'm not at home the dog that thinks he's a guard he's a lap dog but he thinks he's a guard dog is up barking at every little noise because he thinks he's got to protect the house. He thinks he's got to be the man. He thinks he's got to handle everything because I'm not there and he's got to be the one to handle all the problems and bless his little heart. It makes him anxious. He doesn't sleep a week. He lays up in bed panting. He lays up in bed every time there's a little uh, a stick that cracks or a dog that barks outside or a car that goes by. He's on high alert growling and barking because he thinks he's got to handle all of those problems all by himself because the father isn't home. And what I want to show you, church, is that in Philippians chapter 4, when it ends beautifully in verse 9 by saying, and the God of peace will be with you. The main question to peace is not, have I got all my circumstances right where I can finally stop worrying? Because church, the circumstances ain't ever going to be, be right. It's not even, it's not even verses two and three, have I settled all my conflicts so that I can finally have peace? Uh, church, if we're going to be a church, you know, you want to know what's crazy about the church? The church is perfect. You want to know what's crazy about the church? The moment people entered in, the church became imperfect. Okay. So with us interacting together, there's always going to be struggles and there's always going to be conflicts. If we're waiting for the absence of conflict, we'll never have peace. It's not even just simply praying to God and hoping that he's going to sprinkle his peace dust on our lives abstractly and far from us because that's not how we get a lifelong peace with God being distanced from us. The only way we get God's peace is by God being what? With us. We've got to verses eight, whatever is true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, anything worthy of praise. Think about these things. We can't just pray and then say, well, that's it. I've done my part. We've got to ponder, pray and ponder. Think about the works of God. Pray, ponder. And then how does verse eight wrap up? Think about these things. And then verse nine Practice these things. And by doing those three things, the God of peace is present in us, church. Our world wants a really easy, quick, five-second answer, microwaved, pray and get peace kind of answer. But what our God's offering is a pray, ponder, practice peace kind of answer and kind of formula. Have we been asking, do have I just prayed about it? But instead, have we been asking, have I sought God's presence? Because only by God's presence 
do I have peace. Only by having God in my house can I stop like the little dog laying up at night trying to handle all these problems and worries and anxieties thinking I'm going to do it all my all on my own. Church, we're never going to be able to. The only answer is having the Father back in his rightful house. 1 Corinthians 6, his rightful temple's right here, church, in the hearts of his people, in the hearts of his believers, in the hearts of his followers. So do you have a peace that is lifelong and bigger than circumstances? The only answer to that question is by answering the question, do we have the presence of the God of peace within us? Um, and I think if you have him, you have a peace greater than anything you'll ever know. Do you need that peace tonight? Let's, if we need to pray about it, let's pray about it. But let's not be cheap. Let's not cheap out God here. Let's go beyond prayer and pray about it, ponder about it, and practice it when we leave here to bring him into our hearts, our homes, our lives. Uh, maybe you haven't entered into a relationship with him. The only way to do that, the only way to do that is, is believe he is who he said he is. Believe it so much you'll take up your cross and follow him. Luke 9, 23, follow him into the waters of baptism. But maybe even more importantly than that, Follow him up out of the waters of baptism, resurrected a new creation in Christian 2 Corinthians 5 and walk with him every day after this one. Um, and you'll have that God of peace and you'll have an eternity in heaven. So if you have those needs, um, let somebody know what they are. Um, and, and I believe we will um, have either a prayer or song or something to beckon that invitation.